Hello, this is Talking Europe on France 24. I'm Catherine Nicholson and I'm joined today by the Prime Minister of Croatia, whose country has also just taken on the rotating presidency of the European Union for the next six months. So, Andrei Plenković, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much for the invitation. Well, let's uh, start by running through for ourselves and for our viewers some of these huge issues that the EU has to contend with as 2020 begins. Of course, within the next few weeks, uh, the UK will cease to be a member and start negotiating its future relationship with the EU. There are also battles over the budget, climate goals, prospective new members from the Western Balkans region. And it's all happening amid renewed worries about security after the leading Iranian military commander Qasem Soleimani was killed in a US drone attack, igniting tensions. Uh, plenty to contend with, Andrei Plenkovich, uh, as the year begins. Uh, if I start with uh, that uh, global uh, fear about violence and conflict. Now, in terms of the EU, there's been an urging of uh, diplomatic efforts to defuse the crisis. But uh, considering past experience, recent experience, does Donald Trump, does Iran, does Iraq really listen to the European Union on such matters? Well, indeed, the recent uh, developments in Iraq, first of all, and then the reaction coming from Iran after the uh, killing of uh, Qasem Soleimani have indeed uh, altered the situation in terms of stability and tension in the region of the Middle East, which is for the European Union very important. This has been part of our consultations and also the messages that were sent uh, from all levels, institutional and highest level, and also member states, was to try and uh, make an effort in order to de-escalate the situation, to call for restraint, mm -hmm. to call for dialogue. This in our view is something that should be major consideration for all of us because as responsible members of the international community we would not like to see peace endangered. All right, well, let's move on to uh, matters closer to home. The Croatian presidency of the EU, as I said, just beginning this January, your country's first time holding the presidency. Very many things to oversee. Brexit moving on to its second phase. Internal EU rail over enlargement into your region, the Western Balkans. Are you daunted by these challenges? Well, we are first of all honoured to have for the first time the opportunity to be at the helm of the Council of the European Union, only in our seventh year of membership. Uh, our task and our priorities is to look at several challenges which are ahead of us. That's why the Croatian programme of the presidency has four pillars. One is that Europe that develops, that implies the ent entire economic and internal development, including the Green Deal. The other is the Europe that connects, because we feel that gives more added value from the European project to our citizens. Mm. The third one is the Europe that protects both internally and externally. And the final pillar is the Europe that is influential in the world, and that re sort of touches a little bit our first topic. Mm. The major issues on our agenda politically will be the first one on our plate, besides the Iran dossier, that is the Brexit. And what we intend to do during January, together with the Commission and with our partners in the Council, is to do everything on time in order to ratify the orderly withdrawal of the UK. Mm -hmm. Everything is ready for the Council on the 28th of January, as well as for the written procedure and the consent of the European Parliament. My task will be, together with our services, to prepare the negotiating framework mm -hmm. for future relations. Well, that's very much likely to be the difficult bit, isn't it? Um, even Michel Barnier, who's going to be in charge of those negotiations, already said we won't be able to achieve everything within the 11 month deadline mm -hmm. by the end of December this year of setting up the whole future relationship, ratifying whatever deal comes out of that. Uh, what is achievable? Some kind of bare bones deal on, on quotas and tariffs? I think what we need to do is uh, start from the notion of the sense of realism. 11 months to conclude any international agreement, and especially a complex context where we have a precedent that one of the member states is leaving the Union. We only have 11 months transition period to conclude the first agreement to forge a new relationship. I think we, we should have a comprehensive negotiating mandate, but we should at the same time pick, together with London, those areas where we are confident we can mm. conclude on time. Because the conclusion on time is one of the elements which is perhaps most essential. Well, in terms of economic ties, uh, we keep hearing about what's known as the level playing field. Boris Johnson has made it very clear that he wants to ditch all alignment with the EU on rules protecting workers, consumers, the environment. Uh, are you worried that the EU is moving to become a, a deregulation haven on the EU's doorstep that could just dump cheap goods 
into the EU. Some call it Singapore on Thames. Yes, we have heard about the Singapore on Thames concept. However, I think what we should do is basically try to preserve the rights and um, the position in different markets of both European companies and European citizens in the UK market, on the UK labour market, in order not to have any more difficulties, and at the same time for the UK companies and UK citizens within the European Union. I think that the inextricable links which were forged for the last 45 years have created a type of partnership which is very difficult to dismantle. But it sounds and like the EU and the UK are going to have quite conflicting aims. What Moving we ahead. well, our aim is very clear. Our aim is to have a good relationship with UK, to continue trade, to continue the movement of people without extra restrictions, which would basically be now uh, a new framework coming out of this fact that the UK has decided to leave. And finally, uh, we hope that uh, House of Commons will pass the withdrawal agreement in its final reading uh, in next days and thus alter the situation that we have had to cope with uh, three and a half years post-Brexit mm -hmm. referendum with a dossier that none of us honestly wanted and we never thought it was a very good idea. But what is now important is the clarity, predictability and a reasonable planning for our citizens and our companies. This is what is our objective in the next 11 months. And with Boris Johnson completely opposed to the idea of extending the transition period beyond December 2020, do you believe it is likely that the UK could leave without a deal on its future relationship at the end of this year? I think, think, I think it's up to us to be mature enough to pick up those topics that are really feasible to be completed in terms of negotiations on time. I think for the sake of our citizens and the future relationship of UK and EU, it's much better that we do have a agreement within the transition period until the 31st of January 2020, uh, December 2020. Uh, well, one uh, thing uh, where Brexit does bring some clarity to the European Union, as you alluded to, is that uh, the UK will no longer be contributing to the budget. It has been a net contributor. The Commission thinks there will be around €13 billion Euro hole in the books annually. It's proposed an EU budget that would be worth 1.1% of gross national income. But actually, there are five countries that are arguing that the budget should be even smaller. And this is shaping up to be quite a battle during your presidency. We've got Austria, Germany, Netherlands, Sweden and Denmark saying it should be 1% of GNI. Uh, now, isn't it just mathematically inevitable that if a big net contributor leaves, then there is less money to go around and all the 27 member states just have to accept that? Well, this would be a mechanical uh, transposition of the fact that one big contributor is leaving, and that is the UK. We should not uh, neglect the rabais, which has been here with us since Fontainebleau summit. But I think what is at stake is that we have actually four positions. We have initial commission proposal of the total volume of the GNI 1.1% that dates from May 2018, Juncker's mm. commission and Ettinger as commissioner. We have the approach of several more conservative net payers who want less overall volume. We have the position of the Friends of Cohesion who want to still profit from the cohesion money in order to elevate their development, whether it's through treaty-based policies or traditional policies such as agriculture and, uh, and let's say, regional development such as Croatia. We have been in the club only for seven years and, of course, we still need to catch up with the western part of Europe or the central and eastern Europe. And also there is the uh, position of the European Parliament, which actually wants even more. They're even more ambitious mm. with 1.3% of GNI. So I think the task ahead for us, but most of all for Charles Michel, who has been tasked by the European Council in December to conduct the negotiations on the so-called negotiating box to find a compromise. I think everybody mm. will have to uh, concede a little bit, and perhaps if everybody is a little bit unhappy, then we might have a very good deal at the end. You mentioned that Croatia has only been a member for seven years and these five countries that are pushing for smaller budgets, of course, they're, they're older members, they're wealthier members. Do you, as a Croatian Prime Minister, feel that it's, it's unfair that these wealthier members uh, should be saying, you know, we want to have a smaller budget for these cohesion policies that fund development projects in countries like yes. your own? Well, we have to understand that there is an entirely different optics for those who are well off economically, who are most developed countries in the world, who have been in the club for uh, over 60 years, than those who came later, who had a background of non-democratic system, who were, who were living in democracy only for three decades, who joined either 15 years ago 
mm. uh, 12 years ago or as us seven years ago. So I think there should be a, a sort of tailor-made approach from understanding the optics of different actors within the U European Union. But that is the essence of the redistributory power of the budget, where those who have less should mm. be gradually elevated to the standard of living. And I'm speaking about citizens and our regions as those which are most developed. We should not neglect that. I'm not saying that we shouldn't. We should not also uh, tackle the new challenges, mm. whether it's climate, whether it's security, whether it's migration, innovation, education and other issues. Well, speaking of climate, uh, the December EU summit, uh, there was a common goal agreed to of climate neutrality or carbon mm. neutrality, excuse me, mm. by the year 2030. But Poland refused to commit to implementing it. Uh, it seems a big blow to the EU's efforts to be a leader globally on combating climate change. Uh, some states, for example, the Netherlands, say that uh, the EU should not offer more money to Poland uh, for its transition away from carbon unless it does make this commitment to the climate goals. Do you agree? Well, the debate which we had was, first of all, I would say a more or less a large consensus of member states with few countries advocating why they do have some difficulties. One is to see the calculations and the financial implications of the carbon neutrality until 2050. Mm. That is one. So more precision in order to be sure what are the economic effects. Second is the nature and the fabric of different countries' economies. For those countries who were, as I said, uh, the wrong side, oh, it would have been better if there was no Iron Curtain, but on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain, it is not the same. And that's why some of the countries were have a little bit more difficult situation. But I think that the mechanisms which will be envisaged within the multi-annual financial framework, also with the transition mm. fund, I think here we can find compensations where the gradual addressing of the problem can bring results. Politically, all the others are within the scope of going towards carbon neutrality 2050. I think it's a global trend. That's why Ursula von der Leyen's commission has a paper on a Green Deal already within the first days of its mandate. Well, just uh, one other major issue that we mentioned, uh, the enlargement of the European Union. Uh, a few months ago, France and the Netherlands uh, blocked the start of the formal mm -hmm. EU membership process for Northern Macedonia and Albania, two of your country's neighbours in the Western Balkans region. Uh, France and the Netherlands said that there were problems with the accession process rather than specifically the countries themselves. You told us on France 24 it was a missed opportunity and the member states needed to talk it over. Now you're holding that role of presidency of the EU. Are you winning France and the Netherlands round? Can Northern Macedonia and Albania hope to start accession within the next six months? Yes. Objective of Croatia as the presidency is to have a Zagreb summit between the EU heads of state and government and the countries of Southeast Europe, six Croatian neighbours in the beginning of May. What we would like to do is to offer them a very clear European perspective, a clear timeline, but also methodology and technology of the future negotiations. What I felt during the October European Council debate was there were two types of problems. One was the methodological approach towards the enlargement negotiations, which was predominantly the position of France, mm -hmm. where I have to admit I sense a little bit of evolution, because what we are expecting is the Commission paper on perhaps modifying the methodology of negotiations. And then also the other aspect, which was some concrete reservations of some other member states vis-a-vis -vis the state of fulfillment of the criteria of both North Macedonia mm -hmm. and Albania. In this sense, if the Commission comes up, in, let's say in February, with new report on the progress, then if these two new moments uh, merge and we talk over, as you said, with mm -hmm. the leaders of the countries which had reservations, I think we might achieve a political solution that would enable us to call for an in intergovernmental conference with those two countries, hopefully prior to the Zagreb summit. This is what we are trying to do. That sounds like a tentative yes. One a very short final question. Uh, the start of your country's EU presidency has been overshadowed for you and your party by your party's candidate losing Croatia's presidency in the recent election. How much harder does this make your task of fighting the parliamentary election later this year? Well, we have been in office now in the fourth year of our mandate. We are in the mature phase of the mandate. What my government has achieved, it has achieved a healthy growth of our economy. It has done a huge leap forward in terms of solidarity in our society, increasing wages. But in the presidential we, election, voters seem to disagree well, with... Well, the presidential elections are personalised elections. We are 
happy that the process was democratic. We congratulated the new president. However, we very much appreciate what our president, Kolinda grabar kitarovic did together with this government, especially for the international positioning and, I would say, elevating the clout of Croatia on European and international scene. Andrzej Palinkovic, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks to you as well for watching. I do hope to see you in part two of our programme in just a couple of minutes' time.